Take your Bible tonight, Ephesians chapter 5, please. Ephesians chapter 5, our, another B here this evening, and uh, it comes from verse number 18, where the Bible says, Be not drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Let's pray together. Father, we ask for your help now as we come to the study of your word. Sure, it's been good to be here tonight, Lord. Thank you for the children and their, their singing and for the congregational singing, for the good letter from Brother Rogers, Lord, for the uh, wonderful report from Brother Lapish and what you're doing uh, with the Fellowship Track League. And Lord, uh, though many of the results we'll never know till we get to heaven, uh, who read a track and who heard the gospel and saw it there and asked Christ to be their Savior. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to give uh, back to you a portion of what you've given to us. And now we look into your word and we ask you to speak to us this evening. Lord, we need to hear from you tonight. Lord, I pray that you'll open our understanding as we open up your word tonight. And Holy Spirit, be our teacher, please. Help me as I bring the study and help the people as they listen. And do a work that only you can do in each of our hearts. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, now, Ephesians 5, oftentimes what we can do is just take a verse out, but I want you to, to, to look, first of all, at the first part of chapter 5. Would you do that with me, please? Notice it starts out, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And it talks about our walk. It says in verse 2, to walk in love. It talks about in verse 8, we're to walk as children of light. Uh, we're not supposed to walk in darkness. It mentions, in fact, in verse 3, fornication uncleanness, covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints. Then it talks about filthiness or foolish talking or jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. And it says that uh, it talks about whoremongers and unclean persons and covetous people uh, in verse number 5. And, and he's saying, so we need to not walk like that. We need to walk as children of light. And then verse 15, about walking circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. Well, how in the world can we do that? How in the world can we walk and, and, and live like God wants us to live and live a holy life and resist temptation, there's only one way to do that, and that is be filled with the Spirit. You've heard me say this before, the Christian life is not hard, it is impossible. You cannot live it by yourself. You cannot live it on your own. That's why God gave us the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, he never intended for you to do it in willpower. He intended to do it in His power. And so we're filled with the Holy Spirit. This is really the key to the book of Ephesians, and really it's a key to your Christian life. Be filled with the Spirit. How do I resist temptation? Be filled with the Spirit. How do I not fulfill the lusts of the flesh? I'm filled with the Spirit of God. If I walk in the Spirit, I'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And so I have to have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. How can I be fruitful as a soul winner? How can I be fruitful in my witness for Christ? I have to be filled with the Spirit of God. Hey, if you're not filled with the Spirit of God, you don't have any more power in your witness than the salesman does who knocks on the door uh, and is trying to sell you uh, a vacuum cleaner or try to sell you cosmetics or uh, Avon calling or whatever it may be. Uh, listen, you need more than that. You need more than Jehovah's Witness needs when he knocks on the door, more than the Mormon has when they knock on the door. And the difference is being filled with the Spirit of God. Now, there's a lot of, uh, there, there's probably more nonsense taught about the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the Holy Spirit than almost any other subject you could think of in the Bible. And, and we'll, we'll deal with some of that as we go through this tonight. If we would deal with all of it, this would be a series and not a Bible study, okay? But we'll try to hold it to just a Bible study this evening. Um, uh, I, I read this this week and I thought it was good. Uh, it, it's a um, uh, Bert and Ernie and the Cookie Monster and Big Bird. Do you know those names? You're familiar with the Bible, I can tell. And um, <laughs> they were... Uh, I, guess, I, I guess they were Muppet stars on a popular TV show, The Sesame Street. Well, during the film of a show, they had a special time where they let the parents of some children uh, come uh, backstage to, to see the, the goings-on backstage and not just out in front of the cameras. And following one of the, the shoots of the program, of course, they go backstage and 
this fella, uh, let me see if it gives his name here, Carol, I guess is his name, he took off the head and climbed out of the big bird suit. And one little kid couldn't believe it. And he yelled out, Mom, do you think Big Bird knows there's a man inside of him? <laughs> there's a bigger question though for us, isn't it? Did you know there's a person living inside of you? As a believer, did you know there's not a man inside of you? There's a person of the Godhead inside of you. And it's the Holy Spirit of God. But most Christians live their life and never pay any attention to it. Most Christians live their life and never have had a conversation with the Holy Spirit, never have consciously yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit, but have tried to do everything in their power and not the Holy Spirit's power. And by the way, that's where burnout comes from. And that's where folks who get discouraged and depressed and quit, that's where that comes from. Uh, because uh, doing it in their power and not God's power. It's the Holy Spirit. Now, let me, let me tell you a few things about the Holy Spirit that is not the filling of the Holy Spirit, but some facts you ought to know, all right? Uh, at the moment you were saved, the moment you asked Christ to be your Savior, all right, you were born again by the Spirit of God. The, 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 the very reason you acknowledge the fact that you were a sinner in need of a Savior was the Holy Spirit brought conviction to you. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And of course, you know the famous uh, line that you must be born again. But notice what Jesus said to him in verse number 5. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Born of water, I believe that's a physical birth, and we call that a water birth. And then born of the Spirit, capital S, born of the, a spiritual birth. Notice what he said, that which is born of the flesh is what? flesh but that which is born of the spirit is spirit and it's your spirit that comes alive when you're born again you know when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden God said the day ye eat of that tree you'll surely die and of course they didn't drop dead physically what died in them their spirit died and now they were just a soul in a body and that's what man is until he's born again and that which is quickened or made alive according to Ephesians chapter 2 is our spirit and now we have a spirit that can communicate with God. See, it's, it's a, His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And that's our communicator now. And we can communicate with God through our spirit. But you were born of the spirit of God. Not only that, when you, the moment you received Christ as your Savior, you were baptized of the spirit of God as well. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 said, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. See, that's an that's a, that's experience you got when you were born again. You were, he baptized you into Christ. That's all a work of the Holy Spirit of God, and you didn't even realize it happened. All right? It simply means you now belong to Christ, and that's a work of the Holy Spirit. All right? Then number three, something else happened. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed under the day of redemption Ephesians 4 30 so you were sealed by the Spirit of God in the it, it's it's the um, it means ownership it means security uh, it, it's a finished transaction when the king would put his seal on something nobody could break it that's why in Esther when the king put the seal that that all the Jews would be exterminated when he found out the plot of Haman and, and he said, man, that's done, and he had Haman hung on the gallows, he couldn't rescind that. He couldn't change that, that order that was given because it had his seal in it. He had to issue another proclamation and put his seal on it, and that proclamation would have to override the first proclamation. Okay? And, and so it's a seal that you're God. Now, you, if you have the seal of God, and it's the Holy Spirit of God, and he's, it's God's seal on us that we're His... You tell me how you think someone can lose their salvation. Impossibility. It's an impossibility. And then, then the fourth thing that took place is you were indwelt by the Spirit of God. The Bible says in Romans 8 and verse 9, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So the, the moment you ask Christ to be your Savior, 
The one that came and took up residence inside of you was the Holy Spirit of God. Now He indwells every believer. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. He took up residence inside of you. That's what Paul told the church at Corinth when he said, What? Know ye not your bodies the temple of the Holy Ghost, which ye have of God? And, and he's saying, you, you, You're not your own. And so it, we, we are indwelt by the Spirit of God. Now, nowhere in the Bible are you ever commanded, are we ever commanded to seek these things that we just mentioned. They happen automatically. They just took place when you received Christ as your Savior. But now, we're talking about something different. We're talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit indwells us, but that does not mean that He fills us. We, you, have, you have all of the Holy Spirit that you'll ever have the moment you ask Christ to be your Savior. He, he comes, it's not, He's not a fluid, He's not a liquid He's a person. And you got all of Him. The problem is, He doesn't have all of you. That's the issue. And that's what the filling is, is when He begins to have all of you. To be filled with the Holy Spirit, I must completely yield to God's will for my life. It means that I'm going to give total, complete obedience to God with my life. Romans 6 and verse 16. Would you look there with me please? Romans 6 and verse 16. I'm glad I have a Bible tonight, aren't you? Romans 6 and verse 16. Notice what Paul writes here. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now God be thanked. Ye were the servants of sin. That's, that's before you got saved, before you came to know Christ. But ye obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, the gospel. Okay, then being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. But the key there is, I'm going to serve whoever I yield myself to. And so I have to yield myself to the Holy Spirit. I have to yield myself to what He wants me to do, not what I want me to do. I must obey God to the fullest. I'm going to be filled with the Spirit. I must obey God to the fullest. I have to let the Holy Spirit take absolute, complete, total charge of my life. Not what I want, what He wants. Not what I think, but what He thinks. Not what I desire, but what He desires. It's not my will, but Thy will be done. In every single area, every single time. Filled with the Spirit of God. You see, that's what, listen, that's what brings a little bit of heaven to your soul. Okay? We, we, we sing the song, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Well, how does that happen? Honestly, ask yourself, have, do I see that in my life? Do I see it in anybody's life? And, and, and listen, the only time you're going to see that is when you are absolutely, completely yielded to God and doing exactly what He wants you to do every single time. And boy, heaven comes down and glory fills your soul. It's a true statement. And so the only way we get a little bit of, that we get a little bit of heaven coming to us is by living that way. If you want to have defeat and misery and frustration, then just do what you want and not what God wants. Try to do your own way. All we like sheep have gone astray. How? We've turned everyone to his own way. That's what gets us off track. It's not, it's not always doing the sinful thing. It's just doing our own thing. And that's what you hear all the time, is it not? And we catch our own selves doing that sometimes. Well, I don't see what's so... Well, I don't know what's so bad. Well, I know that's what pastor says, but... You know what I mean? And we get our own ideas going. And so you have to remember, listen, he's, he's resident. He take up resident, but he wants to be president. Okay? 
He's got to rule your life. He's got to be the top one in your life. Okay, so let's look at Ephesians 5. Go back there to Ephesians chapter 5 and let's see what we have. Ephesians 5. Notice first of all now is the command. The command. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. By the way, how many believe it's an absolute sin to be drunk with wine? Hmm? You believe that? Okay. How many believe it's an absolute sin if you're not being filled with the Spirit? Yeah. Uh oh. Yeah, usually if, I, if a preacher up and said, Bless God, you don't drink any liquor! Don't you go getting drunk! You'd say, Amen, preacher! But then he says, Everybody ought to be filled with the Spirit! Let's pray. <laughs> Nobody wants to say amen to that. But it's as imperative in both cases. It's as imperative, it's a command. Be filled with the Spirit. It's not a suggestion. If it's a sin to get drunk, it's a sin not to be under the control of the Holy Spirit of God. You think, you think it'd be damaging to the church if one of the members were picked up for drunk driving? And it's reported in the news or on the paper. If the pastor got picked up for drunk driving? Say, what a scandal. But wait a minute. It's no more damaging than to have church members that are not filled with the Spirit or a pastor that's not filled with the Spirit. Just as much as damage to the church is done. Though it doesn't make the paper. It doesn't get broadcast on the news. But God knows. God knows. So it's an imperative command. It's an inclusive command. Secondly, it's an inclusive command. Notice it says... Be filled with the Spirit. It's for everybody. You think, listen, being filled with the Spirit is not just for pastors. It's not just for missionaries. Not just for evangelists. Not just for those who are, you know, full-time workers. I, I'm not sure where that started. I, 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 I can't find any part-time Christians in the Bible. Okay? You, everybody's a full-time Christian. You may have to work a secular job. You have to work in the world to put food on your table. But listen to me, my friend. You're a full-time Christian. All the time. Every day. Every day. Every hour of the week. Every hour of the day. So it's not just for pastors and leaders. Nobody. There's nothing you do in the church for God. Nothing you do in your life for God that shouldn't be done under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. The preacher, you say, oh, the preacher needs to preach in the power of God. Yes, he does. But the pianist needs to play in the power of God. And the choir needs to sing in the power of God. And the ushers need to usher in the power of God. And the ladies in the nursery need to serve in the nursery with the power of God. And the Sunday school teachers need to teach filled with the Holy Spirit. All of us under the influence of the Holy Spirit of God. It's inclusive. And so it's a command. It's a command. Then secondly, I want you to notice the control. This is the control. Be filled with the Spirit. It's not just about the Spirit inside of us, though He indwells us. What it's about is what else is inside of us. If I poured, if you, if you get a glass out of the cupboard and you pour water in it, it's not just about the water in the glass, it's, it's about what else was in the glass before you poured the water in there. If, if, there were, if there were some things in that glass that didn't quite get clean out of the dishwasher and you poured your water in there and all of a sudden you had floaties going on. Okay? It's not about the water. The water was fine. It was what else was in that glass. It's not about the Holy Spirit inside of it. It's about what else is going on inside of us. What else are we allowing inside of us? That's why, that's why I think James says, the spirit that dwells in us lusteth to envy. He, he desires to the point of being envious. Envious of how we let other things influence us and we won't let him influence us. We can get, we can get real influenced by a football game. I mean, if the Buckeyes are kicking off at 8 o'clock, I mean, we'll, we'll rearrange the schedule and rearrange everything and we'll be in the recliner at 8 o'clock. 
this is this is uh, this is a kickoff time. The NBA Finals are coming up, and the Cavaliers are in it. And nine o'clock Thursday night, I probably won't be there. Nine, I'll be, won't be back from the prison yet. But as soon as I get home, that's where I'll be. You understand? We we arrange our schedule around things, and sometimes when the Holy Spirit sees that, He says, "I wish you'd listen to me like that." I wish I had that kind of influence on your life. Okay? It's a, it, it's a filling. It's a controlling of the Holy Spirit. You see, you got all of the Spirit of God, but does He have all of you? Does He control you? It's kind of like, I don't know, Pastor Lapish, if you ever travel, if you ever have an occasion to stay in somebody's home when you travel, do they always stay in a motel? Or have you stayed in people's homes? Okay. Sometimes if you, if you stay in a home and, and they say, they, they lead you in the home and they say, here's your room, and right across here, the hallway here is the restroom, okay? You feel fairly comfortable, room, restroom. You wouldn't necessarily go roaming through the house. Why? That's not, that's not, he, that's not where he would go. He wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. But it's quite different if somebody walks in and they give them a place to stay and they throw them the keys and say, the place is yours. Have a ball. Well, then I'm a little freer to sit in the living room couch and snap the TV on and see what's going on and watch a ball game or something. I'm, I'm more at home because it's, I have access to everything. Hey, let me ask you a question. What's the Holy Spirit confined to in your life? Does he have free control? Have you tossed him the keys so he can go to every room? Those are, there, there are certain areas that they're not that. Not that. No, you can't have that. Don't go in that room. That room's closed off. You can have company over to your house and say, yeah, here, look at the house. And they say, oh, you mind if we go upstairs and look around? No. No, don't go in that room. Because you took everything and threw it in that room, you know. Huh? Does the Holy Spirit, can he go to every room? Can he, does, does he have full control of your life? Does he feel at home? With you? Does he feel at home with you? I think it was Moody was being discussed as coming to hold a meeting and several preachers were gathering together there to, to bring him to their city and a couple men did not want Dwight Moody to come preach and, and several were very insistent on Moody coming. And they said, well, why, why are you guys so insistent on Moody coming? Do you, you think he has a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? And they said, no, but we think that the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on D.L. Moody. Amen. And that's the way it ought to be. He ought to be in complete control of our life. It's, it's all about control. And so many, so many people, I talk to people every single week, I'm sure Pastor Smale does as well, and, and the frustration and the anger issues they have is because things are, happen in their life and it's out of their control. And they're angry about it. And boy, it's a matter of control. Hey, you know what? It's out of my control, but it's never out of his control. And if God brought this in my life, then that's what God has brought to me, and I will accept that. That is what God has brought to me. Command, be filled with the Spirit. Control, being filled with the Spirit. Then I want to I point out to you the continuance. What I mean by that is, this is a continuing action. You remember when we taught on prayer? It's uh, when, when the Lord Jesus says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. Remember how we talked about how that's not just an ask one time? But it's an ask, ask, ask and keep on asking. A seek, a seek and keep on seeking. Knock and knock and knock and keep on knocking. Because remember in the illustration Jesus gave, it was about that fellow who came at midnight wanting three loaves, and he wouldn't give it to him, but the guy kept knocking. Remember? Get up! Get up! I need some bread! And remember, the Bible says he didn't give it to him because he's his friend. Because after knocking on his door all night, he wasn't his friend anymore, probably. <laughs> but he said, why did he give it to him? He gave it to him because of his importunity. He continually kept asking. And, and the way to get your prayers is you have to continually ask. You know, when our children were little, they come up and you're talking to somebody after church and they come up and pull on your coat. Dad, I look down and say, I'm talking to somebody right now. And they stand there and pretty soon, Dad, 
I'm talking to someone right now. And I keep talking. You know what? If they go away and play and never come back, I figure must not have been too important. But if they keep tugging, Dad, I'm talking to someone, Dad, excuse me just a minute. What do you want? <laughs> huh? You know why? That they weren't going away until they got my attention. I wonder how many times we pray and we just ask for a day or two and we don't get the answer we want and so we walk away. And you know what God says? God says, must not have wanted it very bad. Must not have been too important. But we walk away saying, well, sometimes God says no. When God would have said yes if we'd have been importunity, if we'd have been consistent and continually asking. Well, that continual sense is what be filled with the Spirit is here. It's continually being filled and being filled and being filled and being filled with the Spirit of God. It's not, it's not a one-time thing and now you're good for the rest of your life. It's, not, it's a daily, probably <laughs> several times a day, many times a day, asking the Holy Spirit to fill you. Acts chapter 2. Look at the book of Acts with me, will you please? Acts chapter 2. Most of you know Acts 2 and Pentecost. They're, they've prayed in the upper room now for 10 days. They're doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. He said, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Until you receive the filling of the Holy Spirit. And they're praying for the promise of the Holy Spirit of God. And you know, you know what it is. It, it, in verse 1, the day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And, and it talks about those tongues. And by the way, those tongues are languages of people who were there. They had the ability to speak the gospel to those people. But they were all, the point being, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Not just the apostles, not just, but and all of them, all 120. But now look over in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. They have been arrested and brought before the authorities and about a man that was healed. And then they, they were released, and they're, they're praying a prayer in verse 29, Acts 4 and verse 29. It says, Now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were, what's the next two words? All filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. Wait a minute. What happened to that other feeling? <laughs> well, they need another one, didn't they? You see, it's not a one-time thing. It's a, if it's a me yielding myself to the Spirit of God, yielding to His control in my life, wanting to be obedient to Him in all things, that's a constant thing. It's a continual thing. It's something that has to be Always I'm conscious of. It's not just a one-time thing. See, I was filled with the Spirit back in 1982. Well, you, you, if that's the last time you had it, you, you've been living on your own for too long. You need the filling of the Spirit every single day. In fact, if you're like me, you need it many times a day. And be aware and be conscious of what you need. There's no quick fix or, or cure-all. Every... Every one of us blow it every day. Anybody go all day today and never sin? I need to talk to you after church. Better yet, I'll talk to your wife or your husband. They'll probably set the record straight. But it doesn't happen. Yesterday's filling is not sufficient for today's trials or burdens or sorrows or problems or pressures. You need a, That's why I think David said, I, I'll, I need to be anointed with fresh oil. Fresh oil. Make that fresh to me again, Lord. So we see the command of being filled, the control of being filled, the continuance of we're continually being filled. And then notice back in Ephesians 5 again, if you would. 
the consequences of being filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5. Be not drunk with wine, where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in unintelligible languages, that everyone will be marvel at what you can speak. No, that's not what the Bible says, is it? That's what some people teach. But that's not what the Bible teaches. He says, when you're filled with the Spirit, you'll be speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I, I think there's three results. The first one is inward, and I think this refers to joy. You know what you do when you, you know what you do when you're happy? You sing. Okay? You may sing in the shower, but you're going to sing. Okay? You may sing when no one's around, but you'll sing. Nobody, you never did anybody whistling or singing a song and went up to them and said, what's bothering you? <laughs> you didn't do that. You didn't hear somebody walk into work Monday and somebody's whistling or they're singing a song and you said, boy, you seem discouraged today. What's the matter? No, 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 no. You're happy. You're joyful when you're singing. And it's not, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not an outward show. It's an inward joy that you carry. That, that, that is hard to be explained. But it's not a, listen, it's not a, a, um, it's not a thermometer, it's a thermostat. It, it's not affected by the atmosphere, it sets the atmosphere. You, you, you set it by what's inside. It's, you're you're going to have joy because, number one, as a spirit-filled Christian, you'll be able to say no to the urges of the flesh the urges of the sinful nature. Do you, have to say, do you have to say no to your flesh at all today? What, a billion times? Seems that way. But you, you do, listen, because greater is He that's in me than He that's in the world. And, and, and I have the Holy Spirit of God in me, and if I walk in the Spirit, I'll not fulfill the lust, the urges of the flesh. And so I can say no to the flesh. I'm not going to give in to that temptation. I'm not going to think that thought. I'm going to cast it out. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And you have the ability to do that. I'm not going to think that. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to eat that. Ooh. Left preaching and went to meddling, didn't we? Huh? What are you woeing for, you little skinny thing, you, man? You don't have to talk. You can preach that. But you have that power. And by the way, as a, when, when you're able to do that and you resist, hey, every one of us knows what it is to feel lousy after we give in to the flesh. But, you know, it's a great joy when you, when you get victory over the flesh. And there's a great joy when you've obeyed the Holy Spirit of God. That's great joy. And so we, a Spirit-filled Christian, can say no. And a Spirit-filled Christian says yes to the things of the Spirit. Holy Spirit will give you, I call them impulses or impressions. And you want to obey the impulses of the Holy Spirit. You want to listen to the Holy Spirit of God. When, when you're ready to... to to say some, something smart back to somebody and the Spirit of God catch you and say, don't say that. Say this instead. Or somebody's telling you something and, and this happens a lot to pastors and somebody's telling you something and you're trying to think while they're talking to you, you're trying to think, Lord, what do I say to them? You ever been there? But what, what am I going to tell them? Holy Spirit, help me. And you know what? Boy, a verse will come to your mind or some, a passage will come to mind and boy, that's, that's what you use. See, it, it, and by the way, that's a wonderful thing. And that's not just for pastors. That's for everybody because we're all filled with the Spirit. And it's a wonderful thing to have the prompting of the Holy Spirit and listen to Him. It may be to prompt you to go help this person or talk to this person. Bob Myers over there sits in church because the prompting of the Holy Spirit of Bob Wallace to say, go help that guy. See if he needs some help. At Walmart. And he helped him. Now he can't get rid of him. 
No, amen? <laughs> Bob's with us. He's one of us. See? And, and, and that's just listening to the prompting of the Spirit of God. That's all that is. And, and we all have to do that. And that's great joy. That's great inward joy when that takes place. There's not, nothing like it in all the world. Then, verse 20. It says, Then we're giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we have upward. We had inward joy. We have upward an attitude of gratitude. Giving thanks always for all things unto God. Boy, how many of you are told in your communications, be careful about using the word all and never? You ever had that? Be careful. God didn't get that memo, did he? Giving thanks always for all things. Wow. We, most of us miss that every day. How can we do that? Because it goes back to control, doesn't it? Who's in control? He is. And I'll thank God for what He does and what He brings into my life. Even, it, we can look at, again, you say, wow, well, this wasn't good. We don't determine good or bad. What was Satan's temptation to Adam and Eve? The day ye eat of the tree, you'll be able to say what's good and what's evil. Up to that point, who determined what's good and evil in their life? God did. Ever since that time, who's trying to determine what's good and evil in our life? We are. It's not our job. That's God's job. So well, what are we supposed to do when we think bad stuff happens? Give thanks Always for all things unto God and the Father. See, I can't do that. I know you can't. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. And you'll have upward gratitude. Upward gratitude. The last one, verse 21, is outward. You have an inward joy, upward gratitude, and outward is submission. Notice, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Submission. It's, 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 it's not having to have your own way. When you're filled with the Spirit, you, you get the attitude of being a servant. You get the, the, you're not concerned any longer with your way, but you're concerned to help others. And most of all, you're concerned about God's way. What does God want? How does God want me to respond to this? How does God want me to handle this? What would God want me to do about this? It, it changes you inwardly, outwardly, and upwardly, if that's a word. It changes your personality. But listen, remember, remember what he likened it to? Be not drunk with wine. Does not people who get drunk, their personality changes? In fact, sometimes people, when they're, we say they're under the influence. And a lot of times we want to say they're not accountable for their actions or under the influence. Hey, I wonder how many believers are under the influence of the Holy Spirit. See, a lot of times you ask someone to do something as a believer, and they say, ah, it's not me. I'm not asking if it's you. I guess you'll have to rely on the Holy Spirit then. In fact, I'd rather have somebody say, it's not me, but I'll rely on the Holy Spirit to help me. I'd much rather have that person teach a class or sing a song than somebody say, oh, sure, I can do that. I, everybody tells me I'm a great teacher. Everybody I've ever had to say that couldn't teach the way out of a paper sack. I'm sorry. But don't, don't, you know. Again, that's not a sign of being filled with the Spirit. It's that, it's the submission. And by the way, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Most husbands, they just want to start with verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Woman, submit to me. 
Yeah, but you, you missed verse 21, pal. Okay? Submitting so yourselves one to another. That's part of being filled with the Spirit. And by the way, if you're not filled with the Spirit, you'll never be able to do the rest of Ephesians 5. You'll never be able to live it out. You'll look at that and say, what? I'm supposed to do what? That ain't happening. You know, because you're looking at what you can do. Instead of looking at it being filled with the Spirit of God. Now the question I ask you tonight is this. Are you filled with the Spirit of God? But I don't want to leave you just saying that. I want to give you just briefly here in the few minutes we have left. Is how are we filled with the Spirit? How does that happen? It's one thing for the pastor to say, be filled with the Spirit, and then send you out of here, and, and somebody says, well, how does that happen? I want to I tell you how, to, how that happens. Now, help, help, let me help you. Because this is a mistake I made when I was younger, Bible college, you know. I was looking for an experience. Instead of just yielding to the Spirit. Don't, don't try to, man, I read books and I heard sermons and hear different guys talk about, the, you know, filling of the Holy Spirit. And boy, I'd, I'd walk the streets at night and just praying, waiting for some big thing to happen. It never happened. You know what I mean? Don't, it's not, don't just seek an experience. All right? Let me, let me help you. How you fill with the Spirit? Number one, by faith. By faith. Faith is taking God at His word. And look at Galatians 3. You're in Ephesians. Just go to the book right before it, which is Galatians chapter 3. Verse 14. Galatians 3 and verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Now watch. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Faith is simply trusting God, depending that God keeps His Word. He said, if I yield myself to the Spirit, if I ask Him for the filling, He'll fill me. He'll, if I yield control to Him, He'll take control. And so I trust God about that. I simply take His Word on the matter. And you'll enter into the Spirit-filled life by faith, by taking God at His Word. Believe what he said is true. Secondly, I surrender to his control. This goes back to Romans 6 when it talks about we're yielding ourselves as servants to obey. All you simply say is, Holy Spirit, I'm yielding myself to you. I'm asking for you to control me today. Fill me today. Take over today. Let me do things in your power, not my power. The best I know how I yield to you. Surrender control to Him. Number three, ask to be filled. Remember when Jesus was teaching on prayer in Luke 11? And He said if a, you know, if a son asks his father for a, a fish, is he going to give him a stone? And, and the answer is no. If he asks for an egg, is he going to give him a scorpion? No. And He said, how much more? If you being evil not to give good gifts unto your children, He said, how much more shall the Heavenly Father give the... Holy Spirit to them that ask Him. And so, do you ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, the command is to be filled with the Spirit. So I should ask for it. Ask to be filled with the Spirit of God. It's not rocket science. It's not anything difficult. But you know what I found out? Anything God asks us to do is never complicated. It is simple. It's not complicated to get saved. God did all the complicated stuff and we just have to believe. Amen. And here we simply have to, by faith, yield control to the Holy Spirit, surrender to Him, and ask Him to fill us. And then believe that He has and be obedient to Him. Are you filled with the Spirit? Only, only you know that. It's not about others, and it's not about what other people think. It's about what you know. 
You know, Romans 7 and 8, interesting chapters. And oftentimes I hear a lot of Christians quoting Romans 7. Oh, the things that I don't want to do, that's what I do. And the things that I, I do, I don't want to do. And oh, wretched man that I am. And they say, see, Paul had those same struggles. Well, Paul in chapter 7 is relating those struggles. But I want, I want you to know something. In chapter 7, the word I appears 19 times. 19 times in chapter 7. I, 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 I. But when you go to chapter 8, and you read Romans chapter 8, spirit is mentioned 21 times. Now I want to ask you a question. Why would you live in chapter 7 when you can live in chapter 8? You would want to live, I want to live in the spirit life, not in the I life. If you're living with I, 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 you're going to be, oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of this death? Hmm? The spirit in chapter 8. Most crit the problem is many Christians don't think they can ever defeat the law of sin and death. There's a, there's a physical law I'll demonstrate for you. Let me see if I have something I can, I can use this. Let's see if the lid's on it. This. I'm going to let go of this and something's going to happen to it. What's going to happen to it? There's a law that took effect gravity okay the law of gravity everybody knows about the law and we understand what that is and now I want you to think about something but the question that man thought from almost the beginning of time I imagine is can man fly why can't man fly I don't know who you are but we could take turns jumping off this platform and seeing how far you could jump some may not get very far. Some may get pretty far. But I guess what? Everybody is coming. Why? Gravity. The law of gravity. It, it's going to take effect on every single one of us. Well, uh, it's, it's always been the problem with man being able to fly. But somewhere in the 20th century, people discovered there was another law that could override the law of gravity. That's called the law of aerodynamics. That's how an airplane flies. I, I, I'm told, I'm not an expert in this obviously, that the, the, the law of aerodynamics says when the wind is going faster over the top of the surface than it is below the surface, you get lift that's created. And that's what the airplane wing is. It's shaped in such a way, the air going over causes it to lift. Kind of frightening, isn't it? Now, that law has been in existence since the beginning of the universe. Man just didn't discover it. Till, oh, December 17, 1903, when Orville and Wilbur applied it. They took off in a little aircraft that weighed 750 pounds. Orville Wright flew for 12 seconds. A world record. That didn't stand long because later that day, Wilbur flew for 59 seconds, shattering the previous world record. But you know what? This last February, I got on a plane and flew for 11 hours on the plane across the ocean. And then boarded another plane, and I think that was like 14 hours to get into India. How'd that happen? The law of aerodynamics. The law of gravity overcome by the law of aerodynamics. You say, so what, Pastor? Pastor? What's that got to do with anything? The law of aerodynamics is useless to us 
It's useless to you and me until we want to fly. Then it becomes important. And there's a law that comes into effect when you say, can a man or a woman really live a holy life? Can a man or a woman, a Christian man or woman, really live a life of victory over sin? Can we really live a life of victory over the flesh? Can we really defeat the law of sin and death? Oh yeah. Because there's another law called the life of the Spirit. Life in the Spirit. And it supersedes the law of sin and death. And you can soar above sin and soar above the flesh if you'll yield to the Spirit of God. But the key is the Spirit. You know, in Romans 8 it says, you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh. How do you die to the flesh? The Spirit has to do it. A life of holiness is impossible unless you yield to the Holy Spirit of God. I would, I would urge you tonight, stop living in Romans 7 and live in Romans 8. Live the Spirit-filled life. It'll change your family. It'll change your marriage. It'll change your service for God. It'll change your outlook on life, your attitude. It just changes everything. If you'll be filled with the Spirit. It has nothing to do with you being able to speak some language that nobody knows what he's talking about. That's, he didn't even mention that to Ephesians. One, one church he said that to, the church at Corinth. That was, that was the church that he had to deal with that. And let me ask you a question. Is that the model church you'd want to pattern your church after? Were there any problems in that church? Did, call, did Paul say those were spiritual Christians? Isn't that interesting? No, in fact, he said they were carnal. And he had to straighten them out on some things. That's not where I'd go to get my pattern for a spirit-filled life. I think I'll go with the book of Ephesians and the church at Ephesus. Let's, let's live there. Hey, church, let's be filled with the Spirit. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the command that you've given to us. For every one of us. Lord, I don't just want to be a pastor. I want to be a spirit-filled pastor. I don't just want to be a husband. I want to be a spirit-filled husband. I don't just want to be a, a, a father. I want to be a spirit-filled father. Whatever, whatever we do, May we do it yielded to the Spirit of God. And Lord, I pray that tonight you've touched people's hearts and they would decide that this evening and then many times every day they'll consciously yield themselves to the Spirit of God and ask for Him to control their life. Help us to be Spirit-filled Christians. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder how many believers tonight would just say, Preacher, God has spoken to my heart tonight. I do want to be filled with the Spirit, and I will consciously ask Him, yield to Him on a daily basis, asking Him to fill me, and I will endeavor to obey Him in every area, every time. Pastor, God has dealt with my heart tonight. Here's my hand. Will you slip it up and let me pray for you? Amen. Amen. You may put them down. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. And I pray that you'd help us to be mindful now. It's so easy to hear a message and then we go to our cars and we go our ways and the radio comes on or the television comes on at home and, Lord, the word goes away that we've heard. I pray you wouldn't let that happen this evening. But that each of us, even before we pillow our head tonight, would yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit that we would be filled with your Spirit each and every day. We love you. Thank you for giving us the Comforter. 
Give, thank you for giving us one that's called alongside to help us. That we can live lives that are pleasing in your sight. Dismiss us now with your care. May others see Christ in us this week. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's sing together. It's 128 in your book if you need it. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. Let's sing that together, all right? The windows of heaven are open.